Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Carla, hello, Charlotte, Crystal, Jessica, both Jessicas, Leslie, both Lindas. Let me stop for a second. Um, we have a nice chat opening question for us. Just drop into the chat your name, city, and what brings you in today. Name, city, where you're at, and what brings you in today. We'll give folks into five after the hour before we get started, just in case we have any stragglers. Hi, Kara. Lisa. Hello, hello, thank you. Mitzi, Nancy, Susan and Val, hello. Hey, Charlotte, Mary and Melanie. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. And I always say to do something and then I forget to do it myself. So let me go ahead and Yeah. Well, someone said you can't hear me. Yes, I am talking. Can other folks hear me? Yes? Hmm. Melanie, well, I'm, I'm talking, I'm gonna type. Melanie, folks. Hey, Carla. Hear me. Maybe check your <laughs> Yeah, I've heard it's, it's hot in the South. It's 90, I think it's 91 degrees here, but if it's 91 degrees here, I, I have no idea how hot that is in Florida. It's got to be real hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining. Hey, let's do it. Okay, so we're five minutes after. We can go ahead and roll in. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to be brief because y'all aren't here for me. You're here to hear from the fellows. Uh, here's our uh, schedule for today. Um, just some brief introductions of the Annie staff on this call, and then we'll pass it over to the fellows to talk about their experience. Uh, and after that, we'll have some time for a Q&A. And then after that Q&A, we'll talk about how folks can join the next cohort, how you can apply to join. And so before LaDonna, quick introduction of myself, and I'll stop share. My name is Jeremiah Hedden. I am the fellowship manager for the Annie Fellowship. I got to lead the second cohort of folks you're about to hear from this year. Uh, and I'm really excited about the next cohort and, and being a part of that journey for folks. And then I'll go ahead and pass it off to Kara to introduce herself before I introduce our first presenter. Hi there, everyone. Kara Cook, I am the Director of Programs with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, um, was on the team with Jeremiah to help support the fellowship program. Great to have you all here. I am muted. Okay, so our first speaker, is LaDonna Gaines. LaDonna is the manager of the Alabama Poison Information Center located at Children's of Alabama in Birmingham, Alabama. She's been a nurse for 16 years. She has worked as a hematology, oncology staff nurse, medical case manager, and a specialist in poison information throughout her career. Professionally, she is a member of the Specialist in Poison Information Advisory Council, where she serves as the council chair. She is also a member of Sigma Theta Tau, International Honor Society of Nursing, Alabama State Nurses Association, 
and the American Association of Clinical Toxicologists. She currently volunteers the Junior League of Birmingham and sits on the Sanford Black Alumni Association Board of Directors. She is also a member of the SBA's Connects, where she mentors an undergraduate student. So LaDonna, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see. Does everything look okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep. Okay. So uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is LaDonna Gaines. And as Jeremiah stated, I am the manager of my local poison control center. Um, and we do do a lot of things with environmental health. And so I was very interested in this fellowship. So I'll just go through a few things um, about my project and the organization that I partnered with. And I'd like to note that I partnered with another fellow by the name of Deborah Lett, uh, who is in Montgomery, Alabama. Okay, so uh, part of the fellowship, of course, is to partner with a community-based organization. And the partnership that I had was with GASP. And GASP uh, stands for Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution. Uh, so they were a great group to work with. And as you can see here, uh, part of their mission is to advance healthy air and environmental justice in the greater Birmingham area through education, advocacy, and collaboration. So what were we tasked with? So what GAS wanted us to do was to provide some lay information for their social media sites and their websites regarding these five substances. So you have lead, benzene, toluene, arsenic, and naphthalene, which are commonly things that can be byproducts from um, industry and factories. And so this is why they wanted to focus on these. And with the Poison Center, I do a lot of work with lead. Now, usually that's home um, exposures from paint and things like that. But this was also a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about how lead kind of gets out into the environment um, and affects more of the public without their knowledge. So what did we do? Um, so like I said, I partnered with Deborah um, to create infographics for gas for the social media site and for their website. So what they were wanting was information regarding what to do if you're exposed to any one of these substances, what signs and symptoms could occur if you are exposed to these substances, and what questions to ask your healthcare provider. And again, we wanted these to be in layman's terms, so we decided to make the information on the fifth grade level, which uh, can be kind of difficult with all the medical uh, jargon that we use. Um, but I feel like we've been successful with that part. And so on the next slide, I'm just going to show you, you won't be able to see it well, unfortunately, but I'm going to show you uh, kind of what our infographics look like. And it's just a couple of them. So the first one is lead. And so it talks about what lead is. So it's a metal. It can be found in everyday items like fishing weight. It can be in your water supply, it could be in paint and from older homes, of course, any newer home should not have lead in the paint. Um, what are the numbers? Because this is really still a significant problem uh, for people, uh, whether they're being exposed through industry or the internal external environment or internally in their home. Uh, what are the health problems? And then what to do if you're exposed? Now, this particular infographic does have a QR code. Um, because there's a lot more information about lead. I also secured some free uh, home lead testing kits. One of my project was going another direction, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so they can um, request those through this QR code 
and then find out information about water in their uh, about lead in their in the water in their local area. A link to all of that is in there. Then the next one is naphthalene. There are no numbers per se, and so we really didn't focus on that there. Just the photo of what naphthalene is in, and that's a picture of some mothballs and a and a dead bug. But I, I wanted people to be able to understand kind of what the mothballs do. And then really nothing different. The QR code on this one is for the National Pesticide Information Center. Uh, also part of the fellowship, we were to do presentations um, to other healthcare providers. And so I decided to do um, lead and arsenic. And I presented those to staff members at the Alabama Poison Information Center so that they were better aware of how to treat uh, these types of patients if they were uh, to get a call about them. Okay, so um, some other items just to briefly mention. Uh, free lead testing kits, like I said, um, initially my project was going in a different direction or I had a different thought as to what I wanted to do as far as the project for this. So those came before my project was solidified. Uh, some barriers was kind of determining the project and the scope of what this project is meant to be and, and not um, trying to go kind of outside of those boundaries. So that was a little bit of a barrier. And because of that, it was difficult to find a CBO to partner with. Um, but luckily, our great team, Kara and Jeremiah, stepped in, and they were able to get me um, set up with gas, who was local. Um, so those were some barriers. We had plenty of time. Jeremiah will tell you I was kind of panicking in January or December, like, what am I going to do? But everything worked out just fine. You just have to give yourself grace so that if any of you do decide to join this fellowship and go through it, just make sure not to feel overwhelmed if things aren't going as quickly as you thought. And I think others will be able to tell you the same, that maybe what you start with won't be what you finish with it. But the important thing is that you partner with this community-based organization to help them with something that they needed, or maybe something they didn't know they needed that's gonna be good for the community. And to finish up, uh, we had a convening in May um, in Minneapolis to close out the fellowship. So I will talk about a little bit about some of those things. And this was a question we were asked um, during that. So highlights from the fellowship or what am I proud of myself for? So highlights, getting to partner and learn more about a local community-based organization, about what they do, about um, the people that use their, their information, uh, getting to know their leaders and kind of understanding their thought process about what is needed currently. Uh, learning more about environmental health, laws, policies, organizations. We had speakers every month and they came with a variety of topics and I learned so many things. So that was a big highlight for me. I like uh, things around laws and policies. So any as much as they talked about that, I really, really enjoyed. And then, of course, getting to meet new people, getting to partner with another fellow. Um, that was not expected, but that was a, a great help and another opportunity for me to get to know someone better. And then my mentor, um, Azita, I don't know why I'm blinking on Azita's last name, but getting to meet and work with her, and hopefully she will be uh, a mentor again next year. So uh, learning about other uh, fellows projects and initiatives in other states. When we had this convening and really, really getting into the meat of what everybody did, I was just in awe and amazed at the great projects that people did, the deliverables they had, and how much of an impact they had. So that was a huge highlight for me, and I'm just so proud of everybody putting in all the time and work and effort and just coming out with all of this great stuff. And they're continuing on. I think I don't think anybody's stopping. I think everyone is, is still um, somewhat partner with the CBO or either in environmental health in some type of way. 
uh, wonderful feedback and suggestions from the convening. You actually get to spend a few minutes talking about your project. And so there was lots of information coming in that I hadn't thought of, of what we could do with the infographics outside of the uh, online. And then learning more about myself. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, I don't love public speaking, but they pushed me to do it in, in Minnesota. They didn't push me to do it this time. I actually was, you know, ready for it this time because after the panel, um, but I really, really wanted to be a part of letting the possible next group know how great this fellowship is, how much you'll learn, how much you'll be able to use in your communities and share with your fellow healthcare providers. So I am at about 10 minutes and that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, LaDonna. Uh, folks, if we can, could we put up some reactions? I think in the reactions, there's a clap. Yeah, just a social appreciation. We'll have some time for questions for everyone, but I want to make sure we give everyone their time in case people have other questions for folks. And so I'm going to go ahead and prepare us for our next speaker, uh, who is Gloria Barrera. Gloria currently works as a certified school nurse at a public high school outside of Chicago and visiting clinical associate professor of nursing at UIC. She is committed to being a lifelong learner and continues her efforts in improving child health outcomes and our most vulnerable populations through her current practice, advocacy, and teaching. Barrera was elected as the first Latina president of the Illinois Association of School Nurses in 2020. She's been engaged with uh, ANA Illinois by serving as an expert panel member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Community and elected as representative to the ANA Membership Assembly for 2023. Gloria was appointed to the IDPH Diversity and Healthcare Professions Task Force, as well as the Governor's Illinois Terrorism Tax Force's School Safety Committee. She's a vital member and holds a chair-elect position within the American Public Health Association's nurse section. She's an active representation of Hispanic nurses on the Nursing Coalition on Climate Change and Health and an Annie Fellow with the previous cohort. She has gained an interest in addressing environmental health issues and protecting public health from climate change. She's been recognized for her leadership and community work by several organizations, both locally and nationally, and most recently was named 40 Under 40 in public health by the DeBowant Foundation. So I will now give it over to Gloria uh, to talk about her fellow experience. Thank uh, you. Um, I believe Kara is gonna be sharing my slides. Thank you, Kara. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to share my experience as an Annie Nurse Fellow and also talk about my community-based organization highlight my successes and give you a behind the scenes on some challenges. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I'll be discussing my experience in four parts, the community engagement aspect, advocacy, leadership, and then opportunities to come. Um, just before I get started, I'll, I'll uh, share a challenge um, that I had right at the beginning of the fellowship. I was actually out of the country when we had our inaugural meeting and had spotty service uh, during the introductions. Um, so I really felt like I was already behind before we even got started. But my mentor, Kathy, um, Kara, and of course, Jeremiah were very helpful in just pointing me in the right direction um, and giving me the information that I needed to be successful, especially since I didn't have a community based organization chosen yet at that time. Um, so more on that in the next slide. So I chose Pilsen Neighbors Community Council after my first community based organization was unable to take me on a uh, small caveat here, the executive director of the previous organization shared that he was not only the secretary, but also the fundraiser coordinator, the lobbyist, basically it was a one man show, and he did not have the capacity to take me on as a fellow. Um, but luckily he did recommend me to uh, Pilsen neighbors and what followed was my successful experience with them. Pilsen Neighbors Community Council serves as a voice in the Pilsen community, advocating for social justice, education reform, healthcare, immigration reform, and civic engagement. 
Through leadership training and coaching, PNCC empowers individuals to enact positive change for themselves, their families, and their community. Uh, next slide. Uh, the legacy of redlining and environmental racism is pervasive here in Illinois. Uh, polluting industries are intentionally placed in Black and Latino working class neighborhoods like Pilsen, uh, leaving residents with scarce options for clean air. So the state of the air was published during um, my time as a fellow, um, and the latest annual report from the American Lung Association found that more than one in three people living in areas with unhealthy air uh, quality, um, and, and we saw that it fell within um, the, the community that I was uh, serving there in Pilsen. The transportation sector is the largest source of climate pollution um, in the US and cleaning up this pollution is one of the most important things that we can do to fight climate change and protect our children's future. So my focus was really the tailpipe pollution um, and the, the harm that it causes for uh, families and communities. Um, so clean car standards were the sort of the main tool to fight climate change and reduce dangerous air pollution during my fellowship. Um, and, and they really will help protect public health nationwide. Um, and during the program, I did share that analysis have shown that fully zero emission buses will be cheaper to purchase and operate than diesel buses, putting our national school fleet on a clear path to 100% emission, uh, all electric vehicles by 2035, it really is a win-win for all. Next slide. So what was my project and how did I flex my leadership skills? Well, I organized, hosted, and moderated a live expert panel webinar in both Spanish and English on the impact of climate pollution in Chicago on Latino children with asthma. Expert panel members that I gathered included um, Eco Madres, Moms Clean Air Force, Alivio Medical Center, uh, the Chicago Department of Public Health, Mobile Care Chicago, and the American Lung Association, um, along with the Green New Deal of Illinois. So there were approximately 296 live views of the program on Facebook, and the recording has been archived for future uh, viewing at PNCC. Next slide. As an Annie Fellow, I had the pleasure of joining uh, Moms Clean Air Force on a nation uh, national live event to discuss clean air standards to reduce air pollution and shared the effects of tailpipe emissions. Annie and Moms Clean Air Force co-hosted the event and promoted the content via paid ads on Instagram and Facebook that had an audience size of over 1 million views. The ads ran from February 16th to March 17th of this year. A call to action for clean, uh, cleaner cars was made to reduce dangerous air pollution nationwide and protect kids from uh, health impacts of dirty air. I was interviewed uh, in Metal Reports Chicago and featured in the publication on the article published by Northwestern um, titled Transportation is the Main Source of Air Pollution Affecting Children in Pilsen, Health Experts and Activists Say. I was also interviewed by LWC, an award-winning digital media studio whose original work reaches uh, rising audiences with programming that has a social justice vein. Uh, their flagship show is the first open source uh, solutions journalism podcast that received a Peabody Award nomination and earned the inaugural Ambies Award for Best History Podcast. So what's next for me? Uh, continuing to collaborate with my fellow colleagues and really new friends. Um, I see Lisa joining here and, and uh, she and I have already connected about a school nursing opportunity, um, so more to come on that. Uh, I will also be joining the inaugural um, Environmental Justice Task Force Educational Table at Fiesta del Sol, which is this weekend, um, and that's with PNCC. So Fiesta del Sol is the largest Latino festival in the country and is organized by PNCC. Um, the festival sh draws 1.5 uh, million uh, people each year. And also keeping up with the momentum, my team of three, including a past Annie fellow and then um, also a mentor have applied 
to the Cambridge Health Alliance's Climate Health Organizing uh, Fellows Program, um, whose vision is to create a vibrant educational space and community to develop a cadre of health professionals who are inspired and enabled to develop and advance climate solution. So our project right now will focus on advocating for clean vehicle fleets across our states, which um, includes my state, Illinois, Minnesota, and Texas, um, by really strategically partnering with a national community-based organization on outreach, mes outreach messages by nurses. Um, I know that we'll have questions at the end, but I just wanted to share my excitement for those that are interested in joining the fellowship this year. And I will definitely make it a goal in the future to give back and serve as a mentor. Um, I'll hand it over back to Jeremiah. Thank you. Can find a mute button. Thank you, Gloria. So awesome to hear about what's happening. What continued to happen after the fellowship. So thank you for those updates. Yes, thank you folks for sharing reactions as well. Uh, I hope folks are writing down questions. I know I have a few myself, <laughs> but <laughs> before I get sidetracked, I want to introduce um, our last, but definitely not least speaker, uh, Joe Bowman. Let me pull up your slide, Joe. Ba -ba -ba -ba. All right, we can see that. All right, so Joe grew up in rural Pennsylvania, enjoyed playing sports while in high school, and joined the U.S. Army after high school. After his service, he went to school becoming a paramedic in 2000 and working in EMS for 12 years. Joe completed his BSN in 2009 and began working at Wake Med Health and Hospitals in Raleigh, North Carolina, working in several roles as a CICU nurse, then cardiac cath lab nurse, gaining proficiency in the cardiac cath PCI peripheral and neurovascular intervention, and structural heart procedures. In 2015, Joe became cardiac cath lab clinical coordinator at UNC Johnston Health. In 2019, he transferred into the role of chest pain and stroke coordinator for the two hospital system. Joe also staffed as a COVID ICU RN from April 2020 through February 2022. Joe began working at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Public Health in March 2022, in the Office of the Chief Public Health Nurse as the Emergency Preparedness and Environmental Health Nurse Consultant. In May 2022, he became an Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments Fellow, completing his fellowship and his project, and is currently ongoing with the support of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. He is happily married to his best friend and has a daughter who is a junior majoring in biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Take it away, Joe. You're muted. So if you said anything, we did not hear it. <laughs> I love talking on mute. Can y'all see that? Yup. All right, perfect. So, hello, my name is Joe Bowen. I work in the Department of Health and Human Services here in North Carolina. Um, I'm going to just buzz through these first couple of slides. I don't like reading PowerPoints. Everybody's an adult learner, so um, I'm not going to do a whole lot of reading directly from the slides. I will uh, let you all do that as needed. Um, so, my project uh, is an enduring project um, here at Department of Health and Human Services. Our initial goal was to have 10 departments, 10 local health departments, report on a environmental justice in their community health assessments, which are done on either an annual or three or four year cycle. I will speak to one of the challenges of my project moving forward um, was as a governmental public health nurse, I was limited with who I could partner with initially. Um, with the state, we have to have an existing relationship or partnership with a community-based organization in order to interact officially with them. So I ended up um, starting out with uh, West End Revitalization Association, Omega and Brenda Wilson at Ameb in North Carolina. They partnered with the Alamance County Health Department here in North Carolina to, based upon my research, um, I believe they published the first environmental justice community health assessment chapter uh, for any county or municipality in the country. Um, just briefly also to touch, North Carolina is a decentralized state, so all 100 counties run their own health departments. The state provides support and uh, 
certification purview, that sort of things, but we don't control or, or direct the actions of any of the local health departments. Um, so that was an initial challenge. Um, completed some training on environmental justice, um, reached out with the project proposal in November and initially eight health departments engaged. Um, after that, I began speaking with two um, community-based organization statewide networks that sort of are umbrellas that, that contain multiple community-based organizations across the state. I figured that was gonna be the easiest way to reach the maximum number of, of community-based organizations that were capable of working with the health departments to analyze and, and assess the environmental justice challenges within those counties. Here in 2023, um, uh, Dr. Gidry, who is our DHHS EJ lead, uh, Dr. Ellison, who is the Alamance County Health Department uh, CHOC coordinator, and myself presented the project at the North Carolina Public Health Leaders Conference uh, to a large group of folks, probably 35 folks in the room. Um, then virtually presented the anti-education forum. And one of the things that North Carolina Environmental Justice Network did was they set up a workshop with Durham County Health Department, one of our larger county health departments, which brought in over 40 community organizations. There were probably 65 or 70 people in the room total, but over 40 community organizations within the county showed up on a Saturday, um, went from 9.30 to 2. And we did four tables um, of concentrated conversation about four specific topics, democracy and voting being one, um, environmental Superfund sites and, and contaminant hazards being another, it set up in, into four different groups. And then we split those four groups up. We had, we divided those groups into four and sent them each to other tables. So then we had representatives from all four tables for the second breakout session for 45 minutes to discuss challenges within the county which was then used to formulate who was going to present information on the community health assessment chapter and who was gonna provide anecdotal or lived experiences for their community health uh, assessment. So that was a really cool event. Um, presented to the DHHS and Lunch and Learn, several hundred people signed up and showed up for that. Um, currently, I meet with our my network CBO partners on a regular cadence. We're meeting currently every two weeks um, just to establish further contacts and. Um, currently also working on building a community engagement toolkit for local health departments to give them sort of a roadmap to reaching out to local community-based organizations in which to work um, side by side with them to get these, these issues elevated. Um, there are currently 26 governmental public health departments, districts and alliances uh, have inter expo expressed interest in engaging in this project. Um, data collection hasn't started for the next year cycle, but next year, 2024, there are 58 local health departments that are going into their community health assessment data collection cycle. So we hope to greatly expand on this 26 before um, the holidays. Um, once the local government toolkit is completed, I'm going to basically invert that toolkit to create a access or, or collaboration toolkit for community-based organizations that will then sit not only at Department of Health and Human Services, but hopefully will sit at uh, our, our community-based organization network folks as well um, to be able to get those out to community-based you know, organizations, explaining the purpose of the community health assessment, what it, how it benefits the, the community and, and what comes from that community health assessment, how it guides initiatives and, and how counties address health issues. I've got a couple of slides to give you a sneak peek of the toolkit on um, where it is currently. I know it's kind of small at the, the, the top, but it was very important um, to define what environmental justice is. It's a fairly new topic and I've, I've found that there are a, a bunch of people that don't know a whole lot about it. Um, the second definition there is Dr. Bunyan Bryant from the University of Michigan. He is has provided my working definition for environmental justice since I started this project. It's all inclusive. Um, it's really a beautifully written uh, definition of what environmental justice is. And then one of my community-based organizers, uh, Omega Wilson suggested that, you know, what does it mean? How do you exhibit what causes some of these issues and, and how it affects health and those sort of things. So I had a slide that, you know, goes over different sources of potential contaminants or, or pollution uh, to identify, you know, basically, do these things exist in your area? If these things exist in your area and people live very close to them, 
you, there's likely an impact on those communities. Good afternoon, this is Charlotte. Charlotte, you're not muted. <laughs> so I also included what sources of pollution are we talking oh, okay. about? Okay. Yeah, types and um, actually, what types of pollution um, come from these contaminants and come from these polluters? Um, so industrial sites, emissions, um, people living along highways and, and byways, development of housing parks and, and such on top of contaminated sites, um, potential development of, of low income housing on top of coal ash dumps this sort of thing. Um, and then as a nurse, I wanted to go ahead and include what what can what are the potential health effects on a community? So I sort of went down the a list of some of the negative health effects of these of exposure to these contaminants just to to further identify for these communities, these are the things that this stuff can cause. Preventing the contaminants can prevent or you know, mitigate some of the exposure, some of the effects of, of the pollutants. And then I went into the steps. Um, as far as the first steps, I, you know, identifying um, local contact and, and starting contact. The biggest thing I'm, I'm trying to encourage these folks to do is start conversations, start reaching out. It takes a while to establish trust in some of these communities to where they'll actually talk to you honestly and, and provide you with their um, you know, community science data. Um, and then the second step is, you know, and the first one I also listed off the, the network, the, the network CBOs basically that have the contact with all these uh, county and municipal level CBOs um, as well. And the second step, once the contacts contact's been made, start conversations, you know, figure out what their capabilities and interests are as far as communicating for the community health assessment and, and collecting data, um, history of complaints with, with federal or state level agencies as far as um, polluters or, or people acting as bad actors or outside of, of current safe guidelines. And, you know, be creative. Let these, let these folks guide what they want to bring to the table, what they feel the issues are, so that you're listening to your community and you can actually publish uh, some information that may benefit the communities in the long run. It's not just about getting it on paper, but it's about getting actionable items out there and things that can be done to mitigate or prevent further impact of, of these polluters. Um, if you would like more information on the toolkit, you can attend the SICAN APHA webinar on community engagement tomorrow at two. I'll put the link in the, the chat um, for sure, but my information is next. You can reach out to me directly uh, if you have any problems with the link or registration, or if you have questions regarding my my project as as a whole. Um, I am looking to publish this project um, in the next six months or so if I can. Um, I've got some feelers out there, and I've got somebody that I'm working with as far as that goes. So hopefully, this will be available for public consumption before long. Um, there's my contact information. Um, and I will end my 10 minutes with my any two cohort folks. Woo! Love y'all. Thanks, Jeremiah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, that photo Joe's showing is from our wrap-up convening meeting we had in Minneapolis. Uh, it was a fantastic time. That was what LaDonna was talking about in terms of hearing from folks about what their experience was like. Um, and sharing what all the projects were about. Uh, well, before we jump into questions, one thing I do want to say is that the fellowship is a year-long fellowship, and it consists of partnering, as you see all the fellows talking about, with a local community-based organization on a project of the community-based organization's choosing. You know, one thing that happens a lot uh, in this space as folks will go in with an idea of what a community needs rather than taking the cue from the community as to what they're already doing, what do they need help, support with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so first I'm gonna go answer Anna's question, which is how are mentors assigned and are fellows able to request mentors? So this is a great question. Me and Kara spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was the best way to do it. And the best way to do it, honestly, is by geographic proximity. Uh, and the reason that is, is time zones are a thing. Uh, and trying to finagle 
four nurses schedules across three different time zones is a lot. And so if everybody falls in the same block, it works well. So for instance, we had a, a, a mentor who was in Texas and we had about two nurses in Texas and another nurse that was like just outside of Texas. So those got grouped together. And that ends up working out pretty well because what we try to encourage mentors and their fellows to do uh, is to meet as a group and talk one-on-one, -on -one, but also meet as a group so that folks can learn from others' experience and hear, oh, you're having trouble with that too? Okay, great, I'm not alone in this and build up that kind of relationship. Uh, and that fellow wants to request a mentor, I think that's fine. But again, I, I really think proximity is best, especially in the case of like, oh, this mentor works at this university and has a connection that can help this. That's not gonna happen if the mentor is far away. And so we wanna make sure folks are able to tap into the networks. Um, let's see, the next question we had came from, I believe it's Linda. Yep. What are a few of the most valuable contributions of the mentor role to the success of your experience? So I'll let one of our uh, fellows answer this question. Uh, say that again. What was a valuable con contribution the mentor made to your experience as a fellow? I will jump in on that. I think uh, I give kudos to uh, my mentor, Charlotte Wallace, for the uh, great encouragement she gave me. As uh, LaDonna had said, it was sometimes hard to uh, connect with this, uh, the community-based organization um, that they really didn't understand what I wanted from them and what I could provide for them. So, uh, and, and getting, I think, uh, connecting, getting them to understand that I was there to help and support uh, was a little hard to get across. Uh, they were a little reticent, uh, it seemed to me, about letting uh, someone that they didn't know that was involved in the environmental climate uh, group into their circle. But uh, persistence prevailed thanks to Charlotte uh, that I wasn't encouraged and um, I was uh, disinclined to to use my uh, take charge uh, modus of operandi and let them uh, invite me in. That Thank was you. that was uh, one of the contributions of my mentors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Levita. And for folks who don't know, Levita was also a part of cohort two. There's actually a few cohort two folks who were able to slide on this call because this group is close and they support each other. And I love that. So thanks for joining and thanks for answering. Uh, another question, and this is for the fellows again, what inspired you to join the program and were any of you in school during the fellowship? I'll answer the question. So um, I was not in school, uh, but I was juggling as I still am a full time position and then also uh, a full time position practicing as a public health nurse and then uh, part time in academia. Um, so what what really motivated me to become a fellow to uh, to apply was that I really began participating in policy and advocacy work. This was back in 2014 um, when I was flown to DC uh, with Annie to speak to lawmakers about the impact uh, on methane emissions. And I really have been advocating for public health and our profession ever since. And I just felt like this was a, a, a nice, just a full circle moment for me. Thanks, Gloria. Great, great answer. Um, I'm gonna go to the next question from Jessica. Does Annie collect feedback from the CBO partners on their experience partnering with nurses and their perspectives on the impacts of the partnership? Uh, yes, yes we do. Uh, and we got a lot of overwhelming positive responses from the CBOs and some ideas. A lot of the CBOs asked, Yo, know, there's there's other fellows, there's other projects. What what else is happening? And we didn't build out any kind of way to share what 
the nurses with the fellows were doing with other organizations. And so now we're thinking for cohort three of ways to share that information. So it's not just the fellows who are having this uh, experience together, but also the partners are having this experience together. I think oftentimes when you do this kind of work, you're very siloed. And I, and I think there was a, a request from the CBOs to be a part of this community as well that we did not anticipate. So we weren't able to do it for cohort two. We'll work on it. Joe. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. So one, yeah, I gotta get off mute first. <laughs> So one of the one of the things that's been beneficial from my project as far as that goes is there have been network connections made not just in North Carolina but for instance with a Minnesota EJ table we did a solidarity solidarity event with them while we were in Minneapolis and I have linked up North Carolina Environmental Justice Network with Minnesota EJ table and so that network of knowledge and activism is growing um, multiple CBOs have, have been introduced to Annie through the project. So that that increased networking, I mean, it just, it starts a groundswell that gradually gets bigger. And so I'm, I'm really excited uh, for the future. So uh, the next question is specifically for you, LaDonna from Lisa. Did the CBO provide support to develop the social media website? Was it funding, employee, et cetera? They were talking about the graphics. Yeah, so um, I didn't create uh, a website in case there was any confusion. Um, we did create infographics that's to be used on their already made uh, website and social media. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, there was a couple of people that I was able to contact with questions. So basically, kind of before, right as Deborah was joining me, I had already made one infographic and I was able to send it, let them take a look at it, let me know if that was kind of along the path that they were wanting us to go, and then making sure that it was on an appropriate uh, layman, it used appropriate layman's terms, um, because again, it, it's sometimes hard for us to think of the other direction. But uh, to create the graphics, I already had a Canva account that I paid for. However, uh, in the fellowship, provided a stipend and, you know, I could have also used it that way to purchase, to pay for that. And then if, if people do start to request the lead kits, that can also, that postage can also come from that stipend. Um, but yeah, so basically, yes, they, they did uh, have someone that I could be in contact with, um, but really as far as uh, any monies go, that wasn't really necessary. Yeah, thanks, Lizana, for bringing that up. We we offer a thousand dollars stipend with the fellowship to cover any costs that it might you might incur from doing the fellowship or for completing your project. I know one of the nurse fellows used it for an interpreter, um, for interpretation. Another fellow used it to develop uh, a video about proper medical waste disposal in Montana. Uh, other fellow used it to purchase a book for their own growth. Matter of fact, the $1,000 stipend isn't tagged to a particular expense. So if you were to take the $1,000 stipend as your own like personal use for time, that's fine. Or you can repurpose it to, to help purchase items, um, print materials, whatever. Um, we kind of just had it there as a, as a, for you to use however you see fit. Um, Next question is for Joe specifically from Jessica. Do you have a sense of to what extent LHD PHNs are engaged in the integration of environmental justice into the LHD CHAs? Also, how does this work translate into the LHD chips? All right, two level questions are very difficult for my brain. Um, <laughs> but no, um, so it, it's, 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 it's interesting, Jessica. Um, I have found, depending on the size of the health department, um, local health department, public health nurses may be directly involved in the process. They may have no involvement at all. Um, sometimes it's turned over to health educators. Um, a lot of health departments have uh, different 
organizations within their city that help formulate the community health. This is like uh, Healthier Durham is the collective that gets together to, to assemble the, the Durham County Community Health Assessment that I talked about with the workshop. Um, so the because varying sizes of departments in our state, uh, we have some health departments like Carla Turner on the call has a larger number of public health nurses and school nurses and that sort of thing. We have a county in the western part of the state that has one public health nurse for the department. So she obviously is the DON, she's the emergency preparedness coordinator like Carla. There's also other things that they do so they can't be directly involved in that community health assessment um, in some cases. But as far as the, the health, the, the, and, and the same applies to the CHIPS, it, it just, it depends on the availability of, of staff and, and what their roles are geared for. Um, as everybody knows, all public health has had a basically an exodus of folks leaving from it. So there's been a lot of uh, intellectual value that has left over the last couple of years that we can't replicate. Um, so we're just sort of trying to build out a, a, a program to where we can get it out there and then we can sort of fine tune it as we go. I hope that answered your question a little bit. Let's see. Yep. Thanks, Joe. Um, are there any other questions or should we, can we switch into talking to how to apply? Can you discuss some of the content of the monthly sessions for fellows? Yes. And so as a part of the fellowship, um, we don't want to just send the fellows out, uh, and put all the weight on their prospective CBOs to train them on particular issues. And so we bring in speakers once a month to talk on issues. And so we began with talking about uh, the intersection of environmental justice and health with environmental racism. Um, we had a speaker, Zenobia Harris, uh, come through and speak. And then also Dr. Anna, and I'm blanking on the last name, speak as well. We had someone from the policy department uh, Planned Parenthood talk about lobbying. Uh, we also had someone come in and speak about fundraising. Uh, uh, Dr. Zita Amiri, one of the mentors, talked about how to use environmental mapping tools in your project. Uh, basically, we we do two things. One, we poll all the fellows on what is it that you would all would like to learn about. And we take all that feedback. And then we go into our vast any network to find folks who can speak on those topics and then laid it out basically by how he will ask for this particular training but that one goes first this one goes first and so forth and so forth um so i hope that answers your questions but there were there were a lot of topics over this over the span of the year um but i think they were really informative any other questions thanks crystal All right, if there are no other questions, then let me get into how to apply for cohort three. Uh, the application opens on August 1st. We will be sending out a link through the any list serve. And so if you saw this uh, link to apply to the list serve, then you'll get the email about how to apply with the link over there. Um, in it, there'll be a few questions that you will be asked to complete. Of course, the usual, give us your contact information, resume, we'll be asking for letters of recommendation. And so if you want to get a head start, maybe asking some folks in your network that you worked with in the past for letter recommendations. And then there'll be some short essay questions. Um, those are providing a brief description of your nursing experience especially around working with communities or community-based organizations. So that's a question about talking about your interest in environmental health and including any relevant work experience you have. And then providing a summary of what brings you into wanting to join the fellowship in the first place. Um, and then you just submit, it'll be a Google form. So it's pretty easy to, to, to send in an application. Um, but yes, as you can see, they say apply, apply, apply. There'll be 18 spots for this particular cohort. Um, we are moving for this cohort to do two in-persons. 
um, convenings, an in-person launch and an in-person close. Cohort one had an in-person launch and then COVID happened. So they had to do a virtual. And then COVID was still in effect when the second cohort launched. But as we all know, the all of the conditions got lifted. And so we were able to have that in-person close in Minneapolis uh, back in May of this year. And so we're hoping we can do an in-person launch and close for this cohort. Uh, so there's 18 spots. There'll be three fellows per mentor. So I think that's six mentors. All right, I can do math, six times three. Uh, and yeah, definitely encourage folks to apply, apply, apply. Yeah, uh, it's a really great experience. The network is fantastic. As you can see, the nurses that you heard from were, was just three or four, and there were 21 total nurses doing equally impressive work. Um, so highly, highly, highly encourage you. If you listen to this and feel inspired, definitely invite you to 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 join. Um, I know a few nurses again, are still working with their groups. And one nurse ended up leaving their particular job and is now serving as a director uh, of public health at an environmental health organization. So big change can happen. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you all so much for, for joining us, taking an hour out of your day. Uh, and if you can, one, uh, Joe, you want to drop that link to your uh, session tomorrow. So kids, folks want to join you for that. And then we have a, another follow up. Um, a second one of these with a few more nurse fellows, Levita being one of them. Uh, and so August 9th. Right. He said, August 9th. There we go. August 9th. And I'll drop that link in there as well. To, if you want to register, if I can copy it fast enough. Here it is. Whoop, there it is. All right. Already registered. Okay, Anna. You quick with it. Um, dang. Okay, can you help me out here? I'm, I'm, I am not doing fast with this link. Let's see. We're going to get it. And then I'm going to leave this open just a little bit longer so folks can click. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Did it work this time? Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. Suzanne's already registered too. Well, with that, we are at our last minute. I'll leave the, the space open a little longer so you can click some of these links and have them open. Again, thank you so much. And again, thank you to our presenters, LaDonna, Gloria, Joe. That was fantastic. Always a pleasure to share space with you all. Show some love in the reactions or in the chat. Uh, and we'll see you all in a couple weeks. Take care. Good luck with the kiddo, Jeremiah. Hope you have a great rest of your summer, my man. Hey, appreciate it. Enjoy your camping. I'm mad I'm missing that meteor shower. That That is a... What? I'll take some time-lapse photos and share them with you. Hey, do it. Do it. I'll put them on WhatsApp. <laughs> Thank you. See you, man. Peace out.